Welcome everybody. I'm here with Pablo um, from Argentina. So he's an open source warrior. So he, he's actually developing open source stoves, rocket stoves, and he's actually an engineer. So he's got real designs behind it. He's got CAD and we're discussing how do you do this? So, so he's one of the very few people who's doing open source for a real life. Like he's doing this for a living, just like we are producing the things that we do. We, we have a business model based on immersion workshops. So does he. And the business model is basically training. You can produce things. You can sell kits. But the question came up, he, he, so he's a good person to discuss this with. What happens when, well, it's great if people come to our workshop and start replicating our work. I mean, I say that in general. If anyone replicates it, that's awesome. But what if they are in the same town as me and start competing with me? What do we do then? Is that, is that the question? Uh, that's right. And uh, the first answer, answer I get is, okay, so when more people do what you do, the, there's more publicity. Yeah. And the cake, the cake gets bigger and everybody has a piece of the cake. Uh-huh. Or, or there's another phrase that says the sun shines for everybody. You know? Yeah. And, uh, well, the thing is, how, how do you use that? Because it feels uncomfortable. Uh, especially when you do stuff that you know that you are very special and uh, there's few people doing it but then you get someone in your area doing the same and maybe he's uh, entering the market so he doesn't matter he doesn't matter to, he doesn't bother in lowering his price because he's learning and he wants to develop. yeah so that's an issue yeah yeah and so yeah, I mean, the first thing to say about that, that's, it's a congratulations if someone actually does repeat it because that means your product is good. So that's that's for a start. But second, yeah, you do have to think about it has to be an abundance mindset where then you have to say, okay, how do I make money then? And it has to be based on constant innovation and increasing the pie. And, and that means you're working. That means you're innovating. So, for example, the way to do it is have support institutions such as Open Source Ecology which provide a common platform where everyone pitches into that, right? The way we change the world is a few people like yourself, like, like ourselves. We continue developing and we share everything and it's radically open source. We say that patents are lame, they, they suppress innovation, and we, we just have a different way of thinking about it, which is completely anti the, the mainstream system, which of course relies on proprietary information asymmetries or other methods of market advantage which are typically based on exclusion protectionism but that's all that's all wasted energy you cannot collaborate and we're saying that is not how we should go forward because we always continue to promote the military economy that's just warfare warfare is seen in you know oil wars or whatever but then you have economic warfare. That's that's what our system is built on right now. So we have to have a very conscious effort to say, okay, that is not right, and we can do better. So how do you do it? The for us for OSC we call it distributive enterprise. We distribute the the enterprises openly. How do we make money? Well, we just continue developing. The point is, we really believe that the there is so many opportunities, and we fight for or basically we collaborated with everybody so we're saying okay because we get all these inputs from all these different people we can continue to make products better and always expand the pie and then you ask well well how large is that pie really well that pie is any production at all so take any mundane product soybeans uh, cordless drills CNC machines houses make them open source make them better and you expand the market for everybody. Like, for example, for housing, we are not short of people wanting houses. Right now, everybody wants a house. We, uh, our, our challenge is simply training people, having enough people to replicate our work. So, so our, our work is, okay, we're going to start immersion training programs. We're going to create more competition for ourselves. But we first have to prove it that the stuff actually works. And then we train people. So then we can generate revenue from education. Now, education is big business. 
So there's plenty of livelihoods to be had there. So altogether, we think that the pie is, is big. So does that kind of answer it, or, or does that make any sense? Yes, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it makes sense. Um, makes sense. Uh, it's, uh, I think the, uh, the open source movement is um, more developed in your country than in ours. Uh, uh, mostly, and let me say about uh, in the commercial area, where you, where what, where what you do is what you live on. Okay? Right. You can start a maker space or whatever site like that, but they are like, so many places. And um, you were talking about well, commercial uh, uh, living from it, no? Um, so. It's, it's hard to, it, it, it is, it's inspiring, but um, there's a lot of work to do to uh, change mindset, you know, from, from gra the grabbers, the, the guys that only look at your info and say, okay, I'm taking this, so goodbye, yeah. to collaborators. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's, that way would be much better. Um, we usually get someone saying, okay, I saw this in your speeches and uh, I think it, maybe this can be done better. Or why do you do this? And we get, uh, that's the way we get collaboration. It's not substantial, but uh, we'll see the way, you know? Not the desert. We, we see people. But it has to be a lot more. That's one of the challenges, I guess. Uh, so I, I'm on it, you know, I'm on the open source. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's what we chose to do, and uh, we're facing what, whatever comes. Yeah, and, and I must say congratulations to you because you are one of the very, very few people that do end up doing that. I mean, there's it's rare that someone actually steps out and does that as their source of livelihood. I do not know of any single other person than you, in all honesty. Um, I mean, let's see. I mean, we're here, myself, my partner, Katerina. We're doing it full time. Um, other people like, say, Jeff Moe, Lulzbot, um, he's, he's got a company. He's doing it. Uh, radically open source. Um, I mean, there's a few people, but, you know, like, say, Joseph Prusa, from the Prusa 3D printers, they're they're doing it. Um, though recently they, they we you can't get their their uh, bills of materials for their latest printer though, uh, we we're trying to replicate it, so I don't know where that's going. But I'm saying the idea that people who actually share share and do it for a living is is rare. There's many people who are in the hob the hobby space, people who go to hacker spaces and do something for fun. But that's not how you're going to change the world. That's You really have to talk about the significant production of the current economy and how do you start replacing it so it's not so it, so it starts to leave the military permanent warfare economy. So um, the, the way to do it is you have to, like for example, the you know we ask, okay, so there's going to be freeloaders. How do you address that? Well, the, the ecosystem simply has space for freeloaders. There's going to be people like on our development team we have a dozen people on our development team all of us contribute explicitly for open source and we continue building that um, but say there's a freeloader they can do that because there's you know you can't you can't be forcing anybody because as soon as you start forcing somebody then you're talking about once again not not providing not letting people be free to do what they want but just like Wikipedia has shown, there are more contributors than takers. Like, you, you know, the people wonder with Wikipedia, how can you ever make that better? And it turned out the, the positive contributions outweighed the negative contributions. So that's, that's how we have to build, it, build our work. And certainly that means a dedicated effort like what we're doing, where we're actively culturing the protocols, the actual execution of these collaborative mechanisms whether it's things like uh, one thing we're looking at right now that we will do to get the financial some of the financial feedback loops um, is uh, 
Hero X, which are crowdfunded, crowd design challenges. So you can put on a product out there to develop that openly where you say, okay, this is definitely going to be open source. We can gather the money through crowdfunding to, to actually pay for prizes to do rewards for that. So that's one way to do it. But other than that, we, do, we run workshops and that's how we generate our, our revenue to support this. And right now, this, this next year, we're starting our immersion program. So it's going to be the first time we ever do an immersion program. Um, September of this year, we're planning. And that will be around the open source microfactory, starting with a 3D printer, the filament maker, a small CNC circuit mill, a uh, small laser cutter, and a CNC torch table. So we'll produce all of that. It'll be a month of immersion training. We send people out to run workshops around these machines throughout the world. So we can generate revenue from running workshops, from now scaling the workshop effort where we're actually hiring people to run open source workshops where then they get paid and then they, they actually spend like 50% of their time running workshops and say 50% of their time doing further research and development for a living. So they have a real motivation to make that happen as opposed to hobbyists. So that's that's where we're at. After all these years, we're saying, okay, we have to get very deliberate about uh, getting this out into the world, training people, making sure that people are certified, have the skill set to do this, and starting with something small, like starting with the, the 3D printers and the micro factory aspects. And then the next, there'll be an extension. So how do we keep people involved instead of them defecting? I mean, that's a big question. Say we train these people and we don't want them to co coerce them. We can contract them, say, okay, maybe you work with us for three months or something. But how do you keep people from defecting that that movement? As uh, is very common, people are going to want to defect, right? No, oh, but, but you have to show that it works. Yeah. The only way to show it is that you have to be a living model of what you say that works. That's exactly right. Otherwise, it's uh, uh, the jungle show. Right. And, uh, yeah. That's, that, that, that's the, the, the challenge to, to live off what you say you can live off. And, uh, and not colonizing other people's minds, but showing what you do, being honest, and, uh, and say, okay, you can try it. Uh, you can come try it, get trained, and then go and try it on your own. Yeah. So I think that's a good battle. Yeah. And for us, I mean, the way I was approaching it for most of the time was thinking, okay, we, we produce the brick press, we produce the house, the greenhouse, all these things. And we thought, oh, yeah, it will start spreading like wildfire as soon as it's made. But that does not happen because it's difficult. It's It requires a diversified skill set. So uh, replication is not easy. And that's where we're saying, okay, we have to do very deliberate immersion training so that people can pick up all the diversified skill sets to be able to do it. But so, something I, I'm seeing is that plans and technical information are the first barrier, and we only see the first barrier. But once you remove one, you get a lot behind that. And uh, you say, okay, if I make the plans for the compressed big press, um, that that will be uh, there will be a lot of replication, but you're, what you're telling me is, is uh, you have to teach people how to do it and not die in in the process uh, to, to do it sustainable. That takes a lot of effort and conviction. Right, but then but then you can see if if you're seeing that okay the blueprints carry only so much weight it requires a lot of learning and a lot of um, due diligence to make it happen then that opens up the the education part as a as a revenue opportunity of course so you can now uh, once you perfect something and it's working for you you can get into training and more more formal training like our goal with what we do here is to create a full a world-class research and development and training center so like a university you'd have an option instead of going to university you can learn all these things in in our open source university that's i mean that's that's where we're going eventually how, how is it going for you and uh, teaching even 
workshops in your space and learning barriers, uh, government barriers, or... Oh, we don't have... Uh, what you're doing? No, government bar barriers are little in this country. Um, so that's not an issue for us. The issue for us is gets down to marketing. Can we populate our workshops? And can we get the products to a good enough level to be high demand? So so the bottom line is a quest for excellence. Is that's that's where it has to it has to be. The products have to be better. We have to be very deliberate about marketing now so that we're we're saying okay, now we can run a workshop. We don't run it like once a year, but we could actually run it on a regular basis. And that means you got to have your operations and your whole enterprise in place to to make sure you you're not just a hobbyist, but you're actually running an enterprise. So so basically, yeah. I mean, uh, to, just to continue that, like just, I thought, oh yeah. Uh, initially, I thought, okay, the product we we developed the brick press, and that's enough. Blueprints are out there. They've been out there since 2011. You know, since we published the Civilization Starter Kit DVD with a lot of videos, I was just looking at some of that. We've, we've got all the documentation there for the older machine, which still a lot of people have built. There's been, of what we know, there's a dozen replications of that worldwide. Uh, and that's far from viral. But at that time, I had to ask myself. I had to go through that maturation process, which said, okay, can I release this? Because this is going to be excellent. This is going to be, we're going to make, we could make millions if we just hold it on to ourselves. And then I had to say to myself, okay, what is it about? Is it about, um, you know, proprietizing something or is it about s spreading wealth to the world? And, and at that point, I made a decision being faced with the real question. Okay, what if this is extremely successful and I'm, I'm actually losing out on a lot of money? And I said, no, that's just not important. There's another mission that's more important. So, but that took a, a, a very deliberate and conscious uh, step of growth on my part to say, okay, this is exactly what I want to do, that clarity, I know where I'm going. So that's some, something that everyone has to go through. And people who are like, who are hippies, who haven't done anything but are very idealistic, they have yet to get to the point where they actually have economic power, and then they have to decide, okay, do I actually share it? Because it's very easy for someone to say, oh yeah, I'm all open source, and then as soon as they got a product, they close it up. You know, that I've seen that everywhere. So that's that's something you have to watch out for. Okay, so let's talk about the so to say the brick press, the plan plans are out, people can replicate it. What we simply learned after that time is just as deliberately as we develop the technology, we have to take that kind of effort to develop the enterprise. That means we're producing the website the economic analysis, business plan, production plans, operations, models, marketing plans, all of those assets uh, that are necessary for running a business. We're open sourcing all of that. And if you look at our development template on the one side, look at uh, template on the wiki, on the one side it has all the development assets, like here's your conceptual design, your CAD, your bills of materials, your fabrication instructions. Well, you have to do exactly the same for the enterprise level. And that's where we're essentially right now. As we go forward to make this uh, the enterprises replicable, we develop all of that at the enterprise level, which is a whole level of rigor, just like it is to develop the technology itself. And that's what we call distributive enterprise. Once we document that in a, in a good way, then people can have much lower access barriers to entry. I talked about in my TED talk about uh, lowering the barriers to entry and that's exactly what that's about for all kinds of enterprise in the third world, in the first world, in the fourth world, wherever wherever you are. I see. I'm, I'm looking at the template. Yeah, the development template you have the uh, one, the first level is you got the technology, the second tab is says enterprise and right now it's in, in a state of disarray but you just see all the different assets that go into that it's uh it's just another development process and we're saying that uh, our claim is that it's actually possible to do that to have many people collaborate we're saying that yes we're gonna break through in people's consciousness to the point 
where people are actually seeing, yes, it is better to collaborate. Instead of like a hundred different businesses doing the same thing and not collaborating, you can actually get a better product if you all work together. I mean, it's obvious. Like if you kind of think about it in some way, it's just plain obvious, but nobody does it. Nobody in the world does it. And that's a thing that, that I think is, is going to be the next breakthrough in the human economy. Um, that's... Have you, have you Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like fish in water. They don't know they're in water. Just like right now, we don't know we don't know that we don't really recognize, really pay attention to the fact that we're in a per permanent military economy. You know, uh, it's the competitive way. It's it's just around us. And you know, in kindergarten, maybe that's the last time you hear that you should actually share. But then when you go out to, you know, college and you try to get a job, it's, it's all about that you cannot do that. So there's a, there's a disconnect there. But I think just like humans are evolving, like, you know, at some point, slavery used to be cool. Right now, slavery is no more cool. Uh, different human rights used to not to be cool, but they have, we have evolved to, to them. I think the, the recognition of open source or, or just collaborative development as a as a paradigm, I think that's just forthcoming in a future of human evolution. It's I think it's inevitable as we go into the technological singularity. I mean, the technological singularity, what what Kurzweil predicts for like 2049 or something or whatever, um, the technology is going to help us to learn learn better. So I actually am positive about technology helping us to become better human beings and therefore we can really uh, transcend the human self, just really evolve as humans outside of just developing our technologies. Like right now we celebrate the technologists, various technologists like, you know, like Steve Jobs as, okay, these are the new gods, but it's kind of like one of those th things of the fish and water. It's like we're celebrating that somebody created a gadget and that's like our role model. I don't know. Uh, that's that's not not exactly right. Uh, so so we are definitely like worship, worshiping technology these days. But uh, the narrative about human evolution is not as strong. But I hope in the future that 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 will be more prevalent. People talking about more about how to become better human beings and therefore transitioning all the different uh, institutions of society to better ones. Just like with blockchain, the distributed ledger has huge potential for instead of centralized money system, distributed, distributed money systems. I think that with a distributed, transparent accounting system, individuals can start coining their own money. Uh, but the paradigm, the algorithm that allows for that proper accounting uh, has to be created, and that's like the next Nobel Peace Prize. But I think the, the blockchain has that potential. Like, if you talk, take a look at our work, say say people have productive power and you can actually measure that, put that on the blockchain and people can generate their own money and you kind of get away from scarcity. Uh, I think that's one of the revolutions that are coming coming forward 
as well with the technology of transparent documentation, like in a, the distributed accounting. Uh, that, that that's another breakthrough that that can happen. But um, back to the the topic of um, open development. Yeah, I think it's um, definitely one. I think one of the biggest challenges we face in our work is just that huge cultural barrier that people just aren't used to working together. And as we build our development team, you know, that's what we're recognizing most people struggle with. It's it's not not easy uh, because everywhere we just get examples that of that's not what you're supposed to do, and and people are just not used to it. And that's because that's we're in a matrix of this non-collaboration that we don't really see. But uh, it's definitely changeable. It's all. Sorry, say it again. Oh, sorry, what, I'm missing the question. What is be, what is better for collaboration? Uh, to give attribution to the people that uh, makes the small contribution. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, you get the hydronic stove, and uh, there's uh, a modification and improvement made some though. Do you give attribution to that person and the wiki? Or Absolutely. The, yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Like, uh, let me give you an example. Um, uh, look at our. Let's see. Is it on an open source biodata? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the fundamental things um, about the open source method is that you're supposed to credit other people with with what they have done. Um, so, like for example, like uh, let me see. Open. Uh, let me see. Hydronic stove. Look at our first page of that. Um, I'm, I'm, you can see this in the video if you don't see this on my screen here. But uh, on the first page of the document, let's see. I mean, look at it. Uh, okay, right here. Uh, I, so anyone who's watching this video, look what we have on the front page. We've got the symbols for all these collaborators that, that are some, some way related to or who we're building on. Because when we do the the open source hydronic stove, for example, we're building upon all the work. Like if we do the 3D printer, we're building on RepRap, we're building on Lulzbot, we're building on FreeCAD, we're building on KeyCAD, like all these other projects that just simply have enabled what we're doing. Just like when people take out patents, they're like, oh yeah, I got a patent, now I'm cool. But it's all borrowing on the work of others. We stand on the shoulders of giants, obviously. So that's obvious. But yeah, the essential part of open source is that you attribute. So look at our front page here. We have open source ecology, open source hardware association, creative commons, open building institute, FreeCAD, Michigan Tech University, um, Ross Agriculture, Lulzbot, Wikimedia, Wikifab, Minds, KeyCAD, Arduino, Cura, FarmBot. Like, you know, we're using all these technologies. So, so we want to attribute them. And um, it's good to do that. It's like credit is good, and it's part of that ethic where you say, okay, my ego, like I don't have to be so egoistic. I can give attribution to others. That's being a cool person. Yeah, absolutely. And that empowers people. Okay. Yeah. I, I well, um, but there's going to be a lot of people who will just take your stuff, and they're going to claim it as their own. And that doesn't matter. Because uh, I think in a, uh, while many people do get their power that way, uh, I don't think it matters as long as there's more people who are collaborating. So the work for us is to make sure that we invite people to collaborate. Well, and uh, uh, an important issue is to get a lot of uh, publicity for Exactly. Absolutely. And and what I my comment on that, that's a very important point. Like 
you've heard of um, you know all these time like all these you know new energy people or whatever they get killed because they had an invention or so whatever whatever happens with that well anybody like that if they share open source and they pub they start a wiki and they publish their stuff immediately well you can kill them but it's, but if they publish their stuff already you cannot kill the movement right so it's important like as soon as you get anything if you're worried about somebody taking credit for your stuff publish it i mean it's like almost counterintuitive you say that oh if i publish it someone might steal it well exactly the opposite because it's published and somewhere out there you can put you can look at that and say oh no i actually you know like on our wiki you can see a lot of content and you can say oh someone else can't get a patent on it because we already published it on our wiki so that it does the opposite of what people sorry say it again and the publication Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a scientific paper in nature. It could be as simple as you just go on our wiki and it already has a timestamp in history. And as soon as you post it down there, nobody can steal it. It's permanently yours. That's that's the point of open collaboration. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, talk. But, um, uh, let's see if you, if you like, we can run up. Yeah. With, uh, up. Yeah, okay, so anyway, let's, I'm going to quit this. Sorry, sorry, Paul. We're going we're gonna to close this recording here just to summarize that, yeah, we're collaborating here on some open source stoves, uh, hydronic stoves and and other more advanced rocket stoves and stuff like that. But the point is, uh, it boils down to, like if we talk about open collaboration, the actual execution of it, how do we do it effectively, how do we involve people in that, how do we work as transparently as possible and start getting financial feedback loops around it, uh, because that's how Linux succeeded, uh, by creating financial feedback loops and not falling into any traps. But the last thing I want to just mention is uh, just the story of what happened to open source software and why I think the same thing is not going to happen with hardware. And when I say not, I actually say not for the positive. Because what's happened to software? Now, so open source software, Linux, has absolutely taken over the world. It's on all the back-end servers. It's all of the phones, the Androids. It's uh, the back-end of Amazon and Facebook. Microsoft lost, people. Uh, open source is in. Okay? But have we, we gained the distribution of wealth? No, we haven't. We have failed on a, on a distribution of wealth across the world. So what we have right now is platform monopolies. So open source, uh, Richard Stallman, has created the biggest monopolies of the world. He is the Libre fighter. Uh, he's the figure behind the free software. But right now, open source software creates all the platform monopolies. So, in some way, the promise of open source, in some way, has not been delivered. And is the same thing going to happen for hardware? I think the, the course of history might be just a little different because hardware is so, it's, it can be so much more fundamental to us making a living in terms of more people. Uh, like, software is really still a small fraction of the, of the economy. If you look at the numbers, it's not 10%. It may be a few percent of the entire economy but it's the source of all the the huge monopolies of today uh, with hardware you're talking now about a majority of the economy uh, most of the world around us your house the food you eat that's hardware the car you drive so the the hardware economy is much larger and because the economic distribution potential is so much larger there might be reasons why that will truly distribute the wealth around the world uh, as opposed to software. So I don't know, but because the uh, anything can happen, we can have a totally uh, centralized world or a totally distributed world. It's up to us. But I just think the properties of hardware in that how closely it relates to our very existence and our living, our livelihood, I think there's more potential in hardware for truly distributing the, the wealth of the world around.
So that's just my my prediction on that. We'll we'll see what happens. It's all negotiable. But yeah, let me stop this recording and uh, say it again. So let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. It's up to you and me and everyone else who participates in open collaboration. Okay, I'll I'll quit this recording right now. Thank you.